these are some weird days we're living in for sure. Katrina yeah. was crazy. You know, the the medical triage unit at the convention center was the wildest thing I've ever done. Uh, but this one's different. This one's overwhelming. You know, when, when we uh, when we deploy to disasters around the world, whether it's Haiti or the Philippines or Katrina or wherever, um, I know I can always come home and it's all good. But now there's nowhere to hide. You know, this is a this is a global pandemic that's uh, affecting everybody on the planet. And it's important to remember that we are not going through this alone. Uh, we're going through it with everybody. And yeah. And so what have you been seeing in the last couple of weeks, last few weeks, um, as people are experiencing this? What has it been looking like from your perspective? No, I, <laughs> let me just tell you a personal story. It's like uh, two weeks ago, probably three o'clock in the morning, I found myself sitting on the edge of my bed going, what in the world am I going to do? And then I had this interesting conversation, like, you know, am I going to die? This isn't any good. This is horrible. This is, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to mankind. And, and uh, then I got into this conversation with myself of, Diamond, gee, man, you're a disaster, Doc. You need to buck up. Be tougher. Uh, and then I, then I remembered that when it comes to self-compassion, there's three steps. First is to realize that you're suffering or that you're afraid. So I sat there and I thought, wow, man, you are really struggling with this one, aren't you? And I thought, yeah, yeah. And I had this little conversation with myself. Uh, and then the second thing is to show up with kindness. And so I, I'm just sitting there saying, well, yeah, this is, this is a tough one. I can understand why you'd be afraid. And then the third thing is to realize that you're not alone, that this is, we're going through this with lots of people. So I sat there and I thought, I wonder how many thousands of people are sitting here on the edge of their bed going, what in the world am I going to do? And I thought, we're in this together. We're going to get through this. It is scary, but I'm going to be kind to myself and go back to sleep. And I was able to lay back down and finally get to sleep. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sleeping a little bit better this week. Frankly, I'm in, uh, on day three of a news sabbatical. Decided to quit watching the news for um, three or four days and just focus on uh, taking care of myself and, and getting my my focus back in the right in the right spot and being positive, uh, and then I'll go back to the news tomorrow. Yeah, so uh, so you're not immune to having some of the same symptoms a lot of us are having about anxiety and so on. No, um, I'll have it. And maybe in some ways you find yourself also with a little bit of your own catastrophic thinking around this kind of an experience, and it's probably not even thousands, but millions of people are, you know, experiencing this on a daily basis. Um, you know, what, what, do you, what do you say to the question of how um, this seems to be getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and it feels like we're powerless. Um, is that something you're hearing from people and you're experiencing? And, and, and how do you move that conversation or experience it? Yeah, you know, I came back from Katrina asking myself a question that changed my life. And it's a great question for us to ponder. Uh, that is, why is it that some of these people don't become victims? So, and, and I've vacillate back and forth, um, as I'm sure everybody else does. You know, some days I'm like, hey, this is good. We got this. It's all good. And then some days I'm like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? I don't want to lose the people that are close to me, you know. And so kind of go back and forth, but realizing uh, that we get to choose which direction we face. So that when, when I came back from Katrina asking this question of why is it that some of these people don't become victims, um, what I found is that, that some of these people, even though they lost their homes, they lost their cars, they lost all their clothes, they'd been in the same clothes for like five days, uh, and some of them had lost their family members, and they still did not become victims. Uh, I wanted to understand how they think. Because I sat there in the middle of this disaster going, I don't know if I lost my stuff, if I would stay involved, if I'd stay engaged, if I'd continue to support other people, or if I'd just sit on the curb and cry that I lost my, my cell phone. You know, I mean, you don't really know until you go through it. But I, I began to study how it is that some people uh, don't become victims. And what I discovered was game changing for me. It was really game changing. So, um, let me show you. Can I show you a quick model? Yeah. You all right. Yeah. So, just 
zip over here and show you this. This kind of ca it captures the, um, the essence of what I figured out after Katrina. There's two dimensions to this. There's power and there's purpose. And the vertical axis there is the powerful and the powerless. And the horizontal is the purpose, which are the givers and the takers. So, um, and this is not four different types of people. And this is really important. This model is not a tool so you can point at people. This is a model for taking a look at inside and where you are. And um, my goal is I want to be a thriver. I want to say, hey, I have the power to make a difference. It's not about me and I don't care who gets the credit. But my favorite one to go to when I'm under pressure is I like to slide down into the victim mode. It's delicious. Because if I, if I am in the in victim mode, I can say, oh, man, I'm really having a tough time and you're going to feel sorry for me. And normally you might give me a hug, but, it, you know, maybe you'll, um, you know, send me a note or reach out to me or something. And then um, or at home, I could say, oh, I just don't feel very good today. And my wife will say, well, honey, I'll I'll clean up the kitchen. You go ahead and sit down on the couch, take a break. So I can I can manipulate by sliding into this victim mindset. The controller mindset, these were people that were shooting at the rescue people in New Orleans after Katrina. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you shoot at the people you're dependent upon for your rescue? Um, but I've done this one too. I don't shoot bullets at people. I shoot emails or I shoot comments or, um, you know, you can ask my kids. I shoot looks because I, I have the power and it's all about me. Sometimes I'm the bystander. I just disengage and go, well, there's nothing I can do. This virus is tiny, but it's big. You know, what, what can I do? And then I, you know, I just kind of sit there with doubt and stay on the sidelines. Uh, but my goal is I want to live in that upper right quadrant to say, I have the power to make a difference. It's not about me and I don't care who gets the credit. That's a fulfilling mindset. My biggest concern is that we're going to have a double disaster. The virus is bad enough. The virus is going to do what the virus is going to do. We can, we can impact its impact by social distancing and doing all that. And, and, you know, I think here in Washington state, we've really kind of flattened our curve pretty well so far. Um, but there's this potential for a second disaster. And that's my internal one. How do I respond? Do I get angry at the people around? Do I become a victim and manipulate people? Do I just kick myself to the curb and become a bystander? Or do I lean into this and go, huh, this is an opportunity. It's a new opportunity. How can I make a difference in the lives of other people? Uh, you know, I think those are the questions. I, I continually ask myself two questions. Am I going to be powerful or powerless? Am I going to be a giver or a taker? How am I going to show up? And then pay attention to the internal conversation that's going on. So I learned to recognize these different mindsets that I use. You know, it seems like many of us are in that victim state. I mean, we aren't the ones making the decision about staying at home. You know, that's being made by the government and it feels like the virus is dictating a lot of the terms. What are you hearing from other people in the work that you're doing now uh, about how they're relating to it and, and what's the spectrum of ways that they're addressing it and, and what are you seeing there? Well, well, there's anything from people that are furious with the government for locking everything down, which by the way, I think is the right thing to do. As a healthcare person, I can tell you, we're getting to capacity and several hospitals are already beyond capacity. And so if we get over, if we overwhelm the system, we won't be able to take care of people and we're going to lose people. So it makes sense to do this social distancing thing. Um, but there are people that they'd go into anger mode. And then there are people that say, huh, well, what could I do to impact the lives of other people? Absolutely horrible. But again, do you want a double disaster or a single? I'll take a single. The virus is bad enough. I don't want to be another disaster. I want to make a difference. Um, when I talked to Mayor Romaldas in the Philippines after Typhoon Yolanda, he, he said, and, and man, this just haunts me. He said he got all of his people together after they got just decimated by this thing. And he said, um, your grandchildren are going to ask you when you tell them the story. So what did you do? And that's, that's the question that I'm asking myself. I go, well, when I get through this, we're going to look back on this. I want to live well during this time. I don't want it to, you know, take a deep dive into victimhood uh, or be a bystander or be a controller. I want to show up as a thriver and be creative and 
put my head together with other people and try to come up with some ways that we can make a positive difference in the world during this time. So we can look back on it and tell our grandchildren, oh yeah, it was really tough, but here's some really cool stuff that we did. How does a, what roles do leaders play and, and how have you been see, seeing them respond in relation to this so far? Now I've been doing these um, virtual workshops, not webinars. Webinars are talking head. Workshops, people are rolling up their sleeves and I'm putting, putting them in breakout rooms and choreographing conversations and uh, moving people in and out of different conversations. So um, it's it, my, my perspective as a leader, as I, I would define a leader as somebody that has influence. It's not an org chart. Sometimes some of the greatest leaders are, um, you know, people like my medical assistant that I used to work with, Brandon Gherkin. Great guy. He would show up and you know, I'd come in in the morning. He'd say, hey, Diamond, what can I do to make your life great today? Yeah, who doesn't want to work with somebody like that? So I think the as a leader, my job when I'm in disasters, whether it's Katrina or Haiti or wherever, um, my one of my main goals is to make sure that my team is looking in the right direction. And we do that by facilitating great conversations. And it is so life-giving to do that, that when we're watching the news, it doesn't really facilitate great conversations. But, you know, here's a question to ponder. Just as, a, just as an example, um, in the last seven to 10 days, where have you seen or experienced kindness? in your family, with your, with your coworkers, online, on TV, where have you experienced kindness? As, we, as soon as we start asking a question like that, um, most people will, will stand up a little bit straighter. They take a little bit deeper breath. They get a little bit of a smile. Their brain goes, oh yeah, let me tell you a story. I saw this, this thing that happened. How can we use those things to move forward? Um, it's a better conversation and it's a life giving conversation. It's almost like giving a glass of water to somebody in the desert. When you change the conversation, instead of how are you going to survive? How are you going to thrive? Give me an example of, of kindness that you've seen in the last seven to 10, to 10 days. Kick that one around with your, with your family at the dinner table. It's a, it's a great conversation. On the one hand, people might say that, oh, you're being unrealistic or it's naive to, uh, or Pollyanna, to think about the positive at a time when things are so hard. Um, how do you respond to that? And, and then how do you see people, you know, meaningfully going forward and, um, you know, realistically looking at things and yet still stepping forward? And then what is it that they're stepping forward towards? What kinds of things are you seeing? Yeah, that's a, that's a superb question. So am I being Pollyanna? Heck no, I'm a disaster doc. You know, I mean, I have seen crazy stuff in my career. Haiti, Haiti was the most painful thing I've ever done. I spent probably three or four months after I came back weeping after Haiti. I mean, I understand what pain is. I understand when it gets bad, what it looks like. This is, this is bad now. This is going to get worse. So I'm not dismissing that. Here's, let me give you an example of, uh, I want to just share with you, show you a little story about how the brain works. And this might be really helpful. So let me just zip over here and show you this slide. And this is based on some research that was done by a woman named Barbara Fredrickson. She has a, a, um, a theory called broaden and build. And what she says is that these internal conversations that we have impact our emotions and our emotions have a huge impact on our brain. So um, if, you're, if you have positive emotions going on, even in the midst of difficult times, I'm not saying it's not difficult, but if I can, if I can find things to celebrate in the midst of this difficult time, it's like sticking a wide angle lens on the prefrontal cortex. That's this part of your brain that's right behind your forehead. This is where you have executive functioning and problem solving skills. This is where all that stuff processes. This will give me a wide angle lens on, on that part. So I can see both ways down the street at the same time and I can take different parts, bring them together and say, I got an idea, we could do this and I can get work done. This is really important for me when I go into a disaster and there's no infrastructure. We don't have 
communication. We don't have electricity. We don't have a supply chain. I mean, everything is food, water, all that stuff is messed up. It's all, it's all on edge, <laughs> on its end. Um, I have to be able to stay positive because if I don't, I end up like this guy. And I think we've all done that, you know, where you, where you, you get so focused on the negative that you, all you can see is, is this narrow little strip and you end up walking right into a lamppost. You know, it's, um, it's painful. Um, how I respond emotionally impacts the solutions that I can see, the potential solutions that I can see. And I can develop tunnel vision, tunnel hearing, and tunnel thinking when I get discouraged and cranky. On the other hand, remember, we started off by talking about me sitting on the edge of my bed. When I'm discouraged, I don't want to say to myself, you idiot, don't be discouraged. What I want to say is, man, you're hurting. I appreciate that. You're, you're feeling afraid right now. And I care about you. Uh, maybe we should go for a walk. Let's get out of the house. Let's take a break. Let's get some exercise. Let's go do something completely different. Um, and, and then realize again, you know, that I'm, I, we're in this together. I'm not doing this by myself. I'm really glad I'm not doing this by myself. Now, if you were the only one that was vulnerable to this virus, it would be horrible, but we're in this together. So, you know, it's, I, I, it's being aware of the conversation, but also showing up with compassion and kindness towards myself. Um, it's very important that we're aware of these internal conversations. The, the big question I'll tell you that I've been asking myself that changes everything for me. And, and, and maybe somebody will say, well, you're being Pollyanna, but I don't think so at all. My, my big question that I'm asking is what does unstoppable love look like right here, right now? What does unstoppable love look like? That's a great question. You know, this is not a time for me to come up with my mission statement and value statement and put them on a frame and stick them on the wall. This is, I want to boil this down to one question that I can remember. What does unstoppable love look like? So if I'm sitting here and I'm feeling bad, what does unstoppable love look like towards myself? What does unstoppable love look like towards you? You know, you called me up the other day and said, hey, you want to do, a, you want to do an interview? Yeah, absolutely. Because unstoppable love looks like I'm going to show up and do whatever I can to support my community because I care about my community. Um, unstoppable love gets out of the chair and, and makes a phone call or makes a Zoom call or writes a letter or does something. Go out and wave at a neighbor. You know? um, what does unstoppable love look like? And I think if people took just that question away from this conversation, what does unstoppable love look like? It's going to have a huge impact that will ripple out and impact our community. Yeah, that's a big question. That's a challenging question. And it's challenging to hold that together with, you said, that, you know, at least the curve seems to be flattening here in Washington State. We may be further along than other states in the U.S. and other parts of the world. And we're behind some other parts of the world in this. Um, what do you see as things get worse is helpful uh, just to continue asking this kind of a question? Yes. Uh, do you see anything in particular in the next few weeks that, um, that changes the way we may be thinking about how things are? The, after Katrina, I think probably the best way that I could explain what it felt like to be in Katrina was Mad Max and the Thunderdome. You know, it was like this post-apocalyptic war zone where you had people shooting at the relief workers, shooting at the helicopters, shooting at each other, um, stealing from each other. And it was just, it was Mad Max and the Thunderdome. It, 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 and we're not seeing that now with this. I mean, yes, there's some people that are, that are getting cranky, but what we're seeing is kindness. So it could be worse. Oh, and gosh, yeah. it could be a lot worse. And it's, it's hard to have that perspective when things seem like they are continuing to get worse for a while. It sounds like you're seeing that this is going to round out and we will get past this 
even when it seems like things are getting worse? I, I look at this, I have a plan A and a plan B. Mm-hmm. And nobody's talking about plan A. My plan A, which is what I think is going to happen, is we're going to be dealing with this until January or February. We're going to be hunkered down because as soon as we relax, it's going to come rare, you know, rearing its big head back up again. Um, we're building up our capacity, hospital-wise, supplies-wise, so we'll be able to handle more. Uh, but this virus is not going away. It's going to be in our community. Uh, we need a vaccine. We need some reasonable treatments. There's some stuff that's going on um, that I think is going to be very helpful from a treatment perspective. Um, that's you know it's coming, but my plan A is not until May 4th. My, my plan A is this is going to be probably till January, February. My plan B is we're going to be through this by the early summer and we'll have some, some strategies in place and it's going to be awesome. And if plan B happens, I'm going to be delighted. It's going to be incredible. If plan A happens, I want to be ready for a long haul game. Um, instead of, you know, getting to the point where I'm saying, Man, they keep extending, they keep extending. This is ridiculous. I want to go, yeah, I knew this was going to happen. It's going to be all right. We're going to be okay. Uh, How can I best serve the people that I know? How can I best connect with them? What does unstoppable love look like? Are we going to get through this? Absolutely, we're going to get through it. It's a season. It's a long one, but it's a season. It's not not terminal. (laughs) It's not going to go on forever. This is a difficult, the most difficult one that we've ever faced but we'll get through it. 